on that. So. <laughs> So I do have a guest with me today, and just to be sure that I don't forget to introduce her later, I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Let's see. What's the smartest way to do this? I will stop my share and pin Julia. So this is Julia Butts. She is a teacher, a K-12 teacher outside of Rochester. Julia, I'll get you to tell us exactly what school district that is in a second. She is a 2020, yes. You're muted. 21. <laughs> 21. Okay. COVID destroyed everything. 2020 yeah. um, music education graduate at Hartwick, and she is currently uh, a master's degree student at Nazareth. And Julia was uh, my student research assistant on this project, so that's why you're here. Julia, what was the school district you're with? Um, I teach at Hornell City School District, and I teach four through six band. Cool. Thank you. She's got a couple of talking points. We'll see her again, but I wanted that formal introduction. Thank you. All right, you're so welcome. <laughs> so back to the slide presentation. Um, okay, so we are investigating, we meaning me and Julia and some other people hopefully are investigating um, the research to practice gap in music education. And uh, there are some results and roadblocks that I'll share in a little bit. But the first thing I wanted to do was get uh, participant involvement. So when I was a student, um, I was mostly like a band kid. I started in fourth grade in choir. And at some point the choir teacher is like, hey, uh, who wants to see the band instruments? Choose an instrument and I'll let you hear what it sounds like. And that is where I began my journey as a French horn player. And I was in band ever since, literally ever since. I still play in one ensemble at Hartwick. Shout out for the concert on Tuesday night. Okay. So um, as a band kid, there's a lot of hidden curriculum that you experience, just like we all have hidden curriculum within our fields and areas of expertise and just the way that socially we experience the world. Um, but there's also like hidden curriculum in other music education fields like choir and general music and orchestra. So when I saw this, which is King George from the movie Hamilton, I mean, from the Broadway play and now movie Hamilton, <laughs> Uh, there was a moment in the scene where I just was shocked to see some hidden curriculum that was so directly tied to colonialization. And I am wondering if just based on your own social experiences, since so many of us go in and out of music programs, regardless of whether or not we teach it, um, I'm wondering if any of you might recognize it. So you don't have to say it out loud in the moment. I'll ask you afterwards. Let's see this minute and a half of King George telling us how we'll feel once we uh, ditch our relationship with England and become with the colonies, our own thing. I mean, the United States. Anyways, this is King George speaking to an audience in the late 1700s. Um... <laughs> All right, the hardest part about this whole presentation is getting out of this view and back to the presentation view. <laughs> okay, there we go. So um, did anyone catch the moment or some moments? I, well, our choral student already has it, but I figured you would, that's, that's awesome. Um, good news, Julia, is now you're not on the spot for getting it right. <laughs> I was gonna make her answer if nobody else got it. Uh, okay, did anyone else catch this moment of like, is this, is this 
I've seen that before. I've seen that in music experiences, socially, or out in the world, or in movies. Okay, maybe it's maybe it's just me and Camila. I will show you uh, the moment. So he makes everybody join him. And now watch what they do when they join. You mean this bit? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this bit. And also, this little guy over here, he did so great. He found his spot and then turned around and got in, got in line with everyone else. It's little, right? I mean, but this is what the choreographer for Hamilton, trying to give us a picture of colonialism, put in his play. And I recognize it not only from choral experiences, like where I'm a, uh, an audience member, but also from my own brief choral experiences as a person in an ensemble. This, the, the posture, is a way that choirs uh, have their students look uniform when they're performing and get them in a, a certain body shape so that they have the best, you know, vocal opportunities, basically, you know, based on the physics of the body. But it is a really interesting moment to see it reflected as tied to colonial practices in music education. This posture is common in K through 12 music education and the associated concepts. And, you know, we're researching and making attempts to point out colonialization and move away from colonial practices and incorporate culturally relevant pedagogy in our um, teaching efforts. But, uh, you know, there's, come on, little fella, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> artist part of the presentation but it's not it's not a stream a smooth streamline right so my research is usually guided by this question how do we affect meaningful change in k-12 schools because if my students my my personal students are future music teacher educators then what i teach them will make an impact in the k-12 schools but that's just a tiny little portion, right? What if what the research that I conduct and the results of that research could also affect bigger audiences since my audience is so small? Okay, so this is a guiding question. Well, I wanted to explore um, what's already been done in this area and is there a relationship between this pathway from researcher to practitioner? So outside of the field of music education, Hattie and Marsh in 1996 said, listen, this has been so researched, it shouldn't even be surprising that there's not a relationship between researcher and teacher. What you should start researching instead is how to increase the relationship. Stop telling us there isn't one, start telling us how to increase it. I thought, okay, well, that's 20 years ago, back in my dissertation time. So has music education done this? And no, we had not. Okay, all right, well, now I've got my research. This is what my dissertation is going to be on. Three questions that focused on the access and use of academic resources, the philosophical statement ranks, and a perception of the relationship with collegiate and K through 12 educators. Findings showed two groups um, access and valued research at significantly different rates, and you'll see those details in a minute. Julia, we're on slide five, so you're next. This study, so this study that I'm presenting on now, was essentially a duplication of that 2016 research with the same instrument, but also I wanted to look at fields outside of music education. So music education, yep, we'll interview you guys again, but I wanna see what other fields of education we're doing because I'm hoping maybe somebody else already had this figured out and we could cut out a lot of extra work trying to, you know, if somebody's already done it, I wanna steal that info and move forward faster. Okay, so I asked OAA for money through a faculty research grant so that I could hire a student worker because this is a lot of work and I did not wanna do it alone. And in comes Julia. Julia's big role was, I mean, she did other stuff, but helping um, solicit participants from fields outside of education. And now, Julia, I'm going to exit this screen so I can get your face in the picture. Okay. And ask you to uh, tell us about your experience. Stop share. Sorry about the clunkiness. All right, we ready? <laughs> yes. Okay. So yeah, we were specifically looking into other organizations to see if they had a survey distribution service to help us distribute the survey. And upon numerous uh, Google searches, we found a bunch of national organization organizations, which were awesome. Uh, we found science, math, um, foreign language, a couple history ones, and sports and special education. So my job um, and Dr. Sheehy is we kind of contacted these organizations by phone. Uh, we left voicemails, we emailed, and we even found them on Facebook to send messages on Facebook. And we contacted them multiple times, hoping to hear back. 
Uh, so ultimately, we heard back from th only three organizations, and that was History and PE via Facebook Messenger. They said yes. And then we heard back from foreign language and they said no. So we had this whole document color coded with who we contacted, when we contacted them, who was a yes, who was a no. And after six months of trying, um, we didn't hear back from any of the other organizations. Thank you, Julia. While you're on the screen, did you catch that moment that I was asking them to look for in the uh, Hamilton clip? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, maybe we see what we wanna see, you know? <laughs> so going back to the slideshow, it's not too, this isn't too clunky, but there are moments of transition. We don't want the directions yet. So Julia summarized it um, really well. And I just wanna add that the reason why foreign languages was a no is they didn't feel like they were set up to help us with the distribution. So they would have helped if they could have. So new directions, right? Uh, we are going to compare just music education and see if the responses from 2015 have changed five years later. Uh, and so here comes some details. Our new research question was, has the response between and within groups changed over time? Okay, well, I developed an original instrument to do the first set of this research back in 2015, not because I wanted to, but because there wasn't an instrument to do these measurements. So I found some questions that would help that were already existing in other fields and designed them to fit music education. And this was also framed by research from these three uh, categories, utilization and access, researcher and practitioner relationship, and philosophical views. Uh, so other research framed this, but again, there were no questions that were specifically trying to get at, is there a disconnect in this relationship? So it's an original instrument. Five question Likert scale, a uh, little side note, I do say Likert. I had a grad school um, stats professor who said he met a member of the family and they pronounced it Likert. And if that's not true, he has pulled the best prank of his life on me. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so same instrument both years. In 2015, the instrument um, had exactly what I just said. And we had three major participant groups emerge. I only expected two. The third group was unknown to me at that time. Um, K through 12 music educators, collegiate music educators, could be me, music teacher educators, music education researchers that have other, you know, specific niches, but collegiate. The third group was people who teach in both areas. And uh, where I was in Mississippi and my experience in other southern states, not very common, but in New York, super common. I think that at Hartwick, we have six uh, part-time music faculty who are full-time or recently retired K through 12 educators. So didn't expect it, but there it is. In 2020, a couple of minor adjustments to the instrument had to remove uh, those philosophy questions. They were cool, but they just didn't really get at the researcher practitioner relationship. So I didn't want to waste their time with them. Um, some minor wording, mostly grammatical stuff. And then I added a participant consent into the survey because some of my <laughs> music education research participants were a little uh, offended that it wasn't in the survey, but rather a separate email. So <laughs> fix that. And then more demographic data, which is reflective of best practices in research like this, or just research in general that's questionnaire data. I don't analyze it because this is a comparative analysis and the demographic data wasn't collected for the first sample, so. All right, descriptive statistics. I'll try not to bore you. The two different um, studies, 2015, I collected it in two groups. My um, dissertation committee at the time thought that I would get closer to the average online survey participant sample, which was 8%. The first round I was below 7% because we sent it out to 10,000 potential participants. And so they had me run it again. And that time we got um, almost 11%. So yay, cool. The second time, 2020, I sent it out once and did not worry about the sample size. I got a little over 5%. It was right before the pandemic. And I should also say it was between about Thanksgiving and January. So I think the timing was probably not great, but I still got a pretty good chunk that was comparable, like an average of the two from the previous sample or survey. So didn't feel too bad about that. Almost 90% of the participants were K through 12 educators. So if you're a, a stats person and get really excited about that stuff, I did have to do some non-parametric sample size comparisons. And I'm happy to answer questions about that later, but not now, too boring uh, for some. Uh, and then same thing that showed uh, both times, about 85 to 90% for the K through 12 educators. 
You'll notice that here at the bottom, there's this big um, percentage chunk, almost 7% of the collegiate educators. Well, they didn't have a category. Amazingly, I didn't make a category for the person that I wanted to be, a music teacher educator at the collegiate level. So all these people had to fill in other, almost 14% the first time around, because I didn't even think about myself in the category. Fix that big chunk of participants. There were less than 60 collegiate, um, collegiate only, and 37 of them were music teacher educators. So big miss, but I fixed it. Findings, not a lot to say in these two slides, because again, I, it's more fun to talk about the other stuff. Um, these, these are similar. The K through 12 um, responses on the five point Likert scale are almost all statistically significantly different from the collegiate re researchers' responses. So they're, they're all high, they all skew high across the field. Most of them are three and above, most of these five point scale responses. But there's a lot of space often between the K through 12 researchers' responses and the collegiate ratings. And usually the collegiate is higher than the K through 12. For example, down here, I feel there are not enough research journals focused on my area of practice. Nope, that's a bad example, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I went there. Um, I fully understand, this is the second from the top, the content of the articles in music education research journals. Um, about three and a half for the K through 12 educators, which is between neutral and somewhat agree. And then almost four for the collegiate, which is somewhat agree, which blows my mind because these are the people writing it, but that's a different story. <laughs> it gets worse. There's more of those numbers. Um, in 2020, essentially the same numbers or very similar numbers, that same question in 2015 was 3.55 and 3.96. In 2020, we're here at 3.53, so it's gone down just a teeny bit for the K through 12, and 4.06, so it's gone up, you know, a little bit more for collegiate. But the way that the directions that they moved increased the gap, which was interesting. And you can see the statistical significance in the stars over here. Some of them were not, but most of them were. This is a lot. Don't worry about it. I'm going to point out a couple. I think that these were way more interesting than those previous questions. And this chart compares 2015 and 2020 on the same page. So these are the ones that I love very much because it, I just think it points to a possible disconnect. I read music education research often and understand it. This is an, a flat neutral for the K through 12, 3.0. Um, collegiate music education researchers, a shocking 3.74. You literally write this stuff. I don't understand. <laughs> but they feel more confident in 2020, so we're getting better, I guess. Um, and then down here, my exposure to research methods will likely change the way I teach music, 3.47 for K through 12. It drops in 2020 to 3.36, 3.93 in 2015 for collegiate, and it increases in 2020 to 4.12. Okay, and then last one, research, this is on the bottom, is a very important part of my career as a music teacher, almost neutral for K through 12 in 2020, closer to neutral, sorry, in 2015, closer to neutral in 2020. Um, but if you look at the collegiate music education researchers, almost somewhat agrees, closer to somewhat agrees than neutral, and then exactly somewhat agrees in 2020. So the way that they answered um, grew apart even more in the in the five years. I, I have... We'll get to that later. Don't want to get caught up. Uh, right now, I actually want to go back to Julia. Julia, putting you on the spot a little bit, and sure do hope that I told you I was going to do this. Yep. Let me stop share. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm just curious to know from Julia's point of view how she includes or how she feels about music education research. She's living in both worlds. She's conducted research with me. She's doing research at the graduate level, but she's also a K through twelve teacher. So tell us about that, Julia. Yeah, sure. So I would say that I occasionally use research in my current teaching. Um, I think I should more, but that's just where I am right now. Um, teaching four through six bands, um, being a music education grad student at Nazareth, I'm definitely prompted to do more research in my classes. Um, I can easily access the research journals. They're accessible to me and I'm exposed to more research. Um, I think if I wasn't in grad school right now, it would be more difficult to get access to the journals and be prompted and encouraged to learn from current research. So were you looking at those questions and thinking about how you might rate them? 
Um, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. It's mostly neutral, I would say. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that's not a bad thing, but it's not great for us, the people who are creating the research and hoping that people like Julia will get the research applied at the classroom level. Julia, how much longer do I have you since I know this is your day off, but you also have to catch up on college stuff? Um, five, 10 more minutes. <laughs> it's a good FYI for me. Share, going back to the results, let's see. Um, okay, I feel this, is, this yes, Parker. You might have this question answered coming up at the end, but is there any geographical data on it in terms of where you got the answers from? Or does that seem shown or is that not to be looked at? So I didn't ask for it in, or maybe I did and I didn't do anything with it, but um, this, since this was comparative, the geographical data, w I don't think it would have helped us um, basically, the picture is, sorry, a little clunky answer. The participant pool comes from a National Association for Music Education, and there are hundreds of thousands of members across the country, and we asked them to randomly sample 10,000. And so they did give me a breakdown of where that sample came from, but, um, you know, it's a random sample, and I don't know that that information would paint a specific picture, you know. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate the question. So this next section, we are getting honing in on that relationship between K through 12 and collegiate music education researchers. I feel like these questions before kind of touch on it, but we get as specific as I could, I think. Um, I feel connected to music to research and music education. That's the third from the bottom. Um, K through 12, 2.89, so a little bit um, below neutral now. This is one of the only responses that we have that are below neutral. Uh, and then collegiate, 3.79. So, you know, they definitely feel connected to their own work. Uh, and then five years later, the response lowers just a teeny bit for K through 12, and it goes up almost half a point for collegiate. And so we do see a pretty significant growth in the distance between the numbers on their responses. Um, this is the this is the big one here, though, and you'll see it on the next slide. I feel connected to music education researchers. So that means that music education researchers are answering this question about their themselves and their colleagues, and then K through 12 educators are answering it about the researchers. So K through 12 in 2015 answers it um, 2.58. That's the lowest Likert response average in the whole um, survey, whole questionnaire. And five years later, it's dipped just a little bit, 2.55. But collegiate answers it a whole point above K through 12 in 2015, a whole Likert rating point. That's massive. And then even more confidently in 2020. So now we're a point and a half difference between the I feel connected to music education researchers and to get to the research question that was asked at the beginning of this new directions. Um, was there a, an interaction effect between um, answers over time? And this is the only one that shows statistical significance in the way that answers changed over time. Even though there was a lot of growth in the K through, in the collegiate researcher responses, as far as higher responses, here's the only statistical significance. So there's not a, there's not a lot we can extrapolate from this one moment of statistical significance. I think a real question that would affect the the um, assessment of this number might be why did the, the collegiate researchers numbers grow just in general? Their responses were often 0.25 or 0.5 points higher than they had been in 2015. But it does point to this um, idea of a possible disconnect in research uptake or a disconnect in the relationship between researcher and practitioner. And so I do have some looking ahead points but before I get into them, since uh, Julia only had about five minutes left, does anyone have questions that are specific to Julia? Julia, I'm gonna put you back on the screen just in case. Or Julia, is there anything that you would like to share about your experience, uh, either as a researcher or now as a teacher? Um, not right now, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> All right, you're doing great. Thanks. <laughs> Well, just in case you're uh, off by the time this ends, thank you so much for taking your time on your day off. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, one question. Can you share a little bit about how much of your curriculum in the classroom is designed by you and how many students are actually in the school or the state has a say in what you're doing? Did you hear that? Yeah, I think I mostly got that. So 
Um, curriculum wise, we are encouraged to do the New York State standard based curriculum. So I've been writing the curriculum with my colleague for um, band and working on that together. And we're incorporating the state standards and all of that. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and to give you a little bit further, like deeper info, Julia basically has a free reign of the music that she wants to pick and the way that she wants to present it. This is really common in the secondary music world, especially. Um, there's just like this existing status quo that's usually upheld by the um, tenured faculty in the districts. And so if Julia tried to go too far away from the norm, she might get reined back in. It just depends on her district. We have another question, Julia. Okay. Who follows up on what you just said? Julia, um, hopefully you can hear me. Do you have a community of peers who do what you do that you should get together with regularly to talk about research? Um. No, I don't. Not not really. I'm part of an ORF group, uh, so I go to some of those workshops, and um, that's where I'm getting more current research and learning things about that with other music teachers in the area, but not in my district. That's so cool that you're part of an ORF group. Yeah. What about within your the people you're going through your master's degree with? Um. Yeah. A little bit. I guess we could get together more to talk about research. I mean, some classes are research based, so I have that, but yeah. Any other questions for Julia before I, I let her leave if she wants? <laughs> okay. Thanks again, Julia. All right. Thank you. All right. So the looking ahead slide that I keep bragging about. Um, for me personally, if, as I do more research in general that involves liquor at scales, I really want to ditch the five point option. I feel like the neutral leaves some questions that just, is it neutral because they don't care about this question? They don't have a response. They don't feel good or bad about it. Like they're truly neutral. It's just too, I feel like there's just, I want more info. And so what I'd like to do moving forward is a six point scale that doesn't have a neutral option with a separate button where they can say not applicable. So I don't know, we'll do, um, I'll do more digging to make sure that's best practices, but that's how I'm feeling. In general, collegiate music education research is trending towards change, significant change. We publish a lot about culturally relevant pedagogy. People are so um, up in arms and defensive or offended or, or protective of this that like I have a colleague um, in the, on the West Coast and she has had a, unplanned sabbatical this semester because of the number of literal death threats she's been getting because she's publishing culturally relevant pedagogy in music education. And of course, here I am thinking, we can't even get people to read this stuff and people care so much about it, they're trying to like threaten this woman's life. Okay, uh, we're also doing stuff on emerging popular music ensembles. There's a massive movement called Modern Band, which is essentially the jazz bandification of the garage band. So jazz band had this really cool place in um, K through 12 schools where all of a sudden we just started integrating it as a chamber ensemble and it's massively prolific. A lot of school, there are not a lot of schools out there that don't have a jazz band. Well, modern band is way more common and associated with the popular music and the social music that the students are making. And so now there's a modern band movement incorporating it as, as I look at two faculty members who are in a band. <laughs> Um, so yeah, incorporating modern band into the K through 12 world and also uh, decolonization. This word started popping up specifically in music education research about 20 years ago, really more prolifically um, 15 to five years ago and it's still being worked on. But um, the reality is the next bullet, K through 12 music educators aren't really taking this up and they do take it up in small ways, but there's a lot of like I mentioned earlier, hidden curriculum and status quo and expectations centered around what a typical music program looks like, especially at the secondary level that have kind of created some barriers. The work is on us though. So when I look at Camila, who's going to be a K through 12 teacher, she's gonna take some information and hopefully make some changes based on her experience as a student. But that is not, it is not her responsibility to change the whole field, or it's not her responsibility to get others to change with her. She might take it on herself, because I know Camila, she's somewhat of an activist. <laughs> but it is our responsibility, the collegiate music educators and other educators. For example, we have this really cool thing called an inclusive pedagogy speaker series. I'm really proud of it. And I, I am the person who started it in 2020. 
And we've had lots of attendance from collegiate employees, people who teach, people who are interested in inclusive pedagogy, and no attendance from K through 12 educators. Because I did not think to invite these people. <laughs> Literally the person presenting to you about how can we build connections and it didn't occur to me to invite them. Okay, so good. Check in my box for something on the to-do list. I'll fix that. But in other way better news, we have people on campus, even on campus even, not just, I mean, it's not just related to Hartwick, but I'm talking about things that you can relate to also, who are already doing the work and not making major mistakes like me. Dr. Pease, Dr. Andy Pease, our Instrumental Programs Director and Wind Ensemble Director, among many other hats, he is actively visiting K through 12 schools and connecting with those um, instrumental music teachers. So last year, for example, he visited over three dozen K through 12 schools across the state of New York. And a lot of those visits happen in break time for us because that's when it works for his class schedule to be there. It's not like he's cutting out on classes to do this stuff. So he is doing all this work to make sure that he's making connections with his K through 12 counterparts. And some of it's selfish, right? We are really driven by recruitment. And in the music education world, if your name isn't known, like Fredonia or whatever, insert name here, uh, we'll say Juilliard, since that is a, sets a different level. If your name isn't known uh, in the way that a Juilliard might be known among the people who wanna be professionally performing uh, musicians, then it's harder for you to recruit. And so Andy needs our name to be known. But also Andy, this relationship is symbiotic. He asks these people to come to Hartwick and to conduct our band and to work with our students. And he has their students come to Hartwick and they play an honor band. And also Andy incorporates all of these things in this bullet above, culturally relevant pedagogy, emerging ensembles and decolonization in his wind ensemble repertoire. It's incredible. And he is really a person that I look to as an example of ways that we can bridge the divide between K through 12 music educators and collegiate music education researchers and practitioners and like show practical ways that you can take on these new topics that we care about and we want to be more prolific. And so um, speaking of looking ahead and being more prolific, I do want to give a shout out to the Inclusive Pedagogy Speaker Series. We have three more speakers, February, March, and April. I'll certainly be inviting K-12 educators, and luckily we already have some times where they could actually be a part of it. <laughs> it's not like all 12 to 1. Um, and here are our speakers, Dr. Leslie Siegel. She's our last external speaker visiting and she'll be focusing on pedagogy and the LGBTQ plus student. And then we have Laura Sanford in March at looking at universal design for learning and Dr. Patty sagasti Sothis in uh, April looking at the international student of pedagogy. And then a brief thank you for Karina, Marissa, Tessa. They are the other three members of the Inclusive Pedagogy Speaker Series and 100% uh, are not responsible for not thinking about the K through 12 connection because literally I published research on it. So <laughs> it couldn't be more on me. And also thank you to the humanities division because they've funded this series significantly for two years. So um, yeah, I know that that got a little away from the original topic and I'll go all the way back to that um, intro slide so that I can figure out what that original title was. I'm not figure out, I remember, just so you can remember. Mm -hmm. um, and ask now, thank you so much for listening. Are there any questions? Rachel. I'm wondering what the institutional support is for music educators. I know it varies widely from district to district, but um, you mentioned working with a national group of teachers. And I imagine there's a national conference that would probably be at the site of coming to, you know, visiting, learning the research in the field. Um, has your research kind of considered those structural and institutional means of disseminating research from the knowledge producing institutions to the practical? Yeah. Um, so there definitely are. The main group is the National Association for Music Education that I mentioned helped distribute the survey. I haven't investigated or thought about ways to incorporate them as a like focus of the research. I do know that they are a way, um, they create opportunities for the dissemination of research in their conferences. For example, um, we, every state, not every state, lots of states have a NAFME conference annually. 
or a state association conference annually. So in two weeks, we've got the um, New York State School Music Association Winter Conference, and it's kind of paired with NAFME. So if you're a NAFME member in New York and you're looking for your state conference, that's the one you go to. There are research presentations available. Uh, Andy and I are doing one. We've got students doing two. Camila is going to do one on podcasting as an assessment. The Brass, Brass Ensemble is doing one about um, something about improv and just like alternative music styles in a formal ensemble. That's Andy's. Um, so that's a great place. And we do, that's mostly K through 12 educators who attend there. And there is pretty good session attendance. Um, it's interesting because it still is like, targeted at a specific educator. So NAFME in general, that's the association's acronym, they have problems with decolonizing and, and addressing and honestly calling out racist practices that they um, support or perpetuate or don't stand against. And so we have very low representation of people of color in that organization, which means that when it comes time for conferencing, the word doesn't get spread in the same way to those people. I know about NISMA because NAFME sent me an email the first winter I was here. And now that I've been to NISMA once, I get emails from them. But what if they never get that email? And, you know, and what if there's not a culture of go to this conference in Rochester, even though you're in New York City? And the conference is in Rochester every single winter. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of barriers that really continue to marginalize people of color. Um, there are other conferences like NAFME will have a, an Eastern Divisional Conference that's in a different state every two years, but it's the same pool of people. And then uh, locally, the school districts have like teacher educator working days, the same way that all the teachers have their, their workshop days. They don't, they usually are just often, and this is not the case for always. It is well, we're gonna have a teacher workshop day, but it's not really gonna be specific for the arts. And so you guys can do your own thing, but the arts aren't necessarily given a professional to help guide them. It's more like, well, why don't you guys get together and talk about stuff? And so that's fine, but let me tell you what happens. We get together and we complain. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, so there's opportunities, but maybe there's just not the resources to hire external people or uh, maybe they just don't know a better way to do what's been done for so long in the same way. Thank you, Karina, um, and then Zach. Um, so, Chris, I'm going to apologize on behalf of Foreign Languages. Uh, <laughs> you guys had a good reason. It's okay. Um, so, uh, second language, like, like so there's like these research results that were what is Matt and Shaw. Feel like exploding everywhere. I see them everywhere. Come up every conference. And she just wrote a book called. Thomas Rea Brown's second language acquisition theory goes to the classroom to address exactly this problem, but in foreign language acquisition, or second language acquisition, I should say. Um, but so she identifies like a few reasons why um, the theory didn't make it to the classroom. And so one of them is um, that often, so theory is always evolving, right? Or learning new things about how students learn the language. And sometimes there's no straightforward answer. Did she talk about that? Um, actually, one of the criticisms we're home is like, she tells you that it can be this way and that way, and there's no clear way. And then, so sometimes the research is, it can be both. Like, you can do this and that, or you don't know, right? So that's part of the problem. So I wonder if that's a step in that's similar in your field. Um, and then another one that is a problem is that um, teachers, branch teachers in the classrooms, that sort of, and middle school, and High school are totally overburdened. They don't have enough time. There's just no way that they're going to be doing research um, to also follow up on whatever. And they have all these constraints that, um, you know, they're not necessarily even the most technically sound things because there's no funding for them to use the right materials. Um, so I wonder if that's also a problem that you see. Um, and also, particularly in my field, at the collegiate level, there's plenty of faculty members who are teaching who are not up on the latest research about language acquisition because they're not teaching language acquisition, they're teaching literature and they're teaching other things. So often that's a disconnect at the collegiate level as well because it all gets thrown into one big bucket but it's very differentiated. But people who aren't in linguistics are not necessarily paying attention to the research of this. So I right. imagine if they're similar type of research as well at, in your 
Yeah, so I'm going to go back. Oh, it's good. I'm going to go backwards since I remember. That's the order that I'll remember them if I remember all three. Um, so yes, we have that a similar fractured situation at the collegiate level. For example, uh, I'm doing the whole shebang with music teacher education, and I don't really get to teach the methods classes. And so I sometimes, but I'm a little bit more disconnected from the actual practical application of these are the buttons you push down on the clarinet, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, there are a lot of people who get hired specifically as the brass person, and they don't ever get to work with student teachers. And so we it's the same thing, right? Going to see these students in the field helps keep me fresh as far as what's literally happening in the field and also connected to that research. But if I wasn't going to work with them, there would be less time, less space available for, for me to do that work. And so that gets at your other question, the time constraints. Uh, yeah, I mean, just in general, K through 12 and collegiate, we all have these wild time constraints. And so it does really um, impact a teacher's ability to be involved in research at the K through 12 level. That was actually a question. Let me see if I can find it here. I'm interested in conducting research neutral for the, uh, I'm sorry, interested, a little less than neutral for the K through 12, um, but I mean, not as far away from neutral as I would expect. I kind of would have expected strongly disagree to disagree, somewhat disagree, just because of, you know, we can speculate on a lot of reasons, but why would they want to add more burden to the time that they already don't have? Um, just a typical day for a music teacher, just as an FYI, might be you get to school early so your students can come into the band room or whatever room to practice. That's pretty common. You stay after school late because you really wanted to have insert ensemble here. Let's pretend like it's a modern band ensemble and you couldn't fit it in the K through 12 day. And so you have it after school. If you're a marching band person, you have parades and blah, blah, blah. So their days could already be 14 hours just with the stuff that they do with their students. And then we say to them, hey, do some research also. And they're just like, why? Why would I do that? I don't even get paid for it. I'm not getting paid for what I do now. Like, So yeah, what was your first one? I can't remember the first part of the question. Oh, that's something for second language acquisition. The people do, they don't agree. Like you don't have like a manual that you can point to and say, this is the best way to do this thing because conflicting research or it's a gray area so I'm not sure there's similarities I mean I'm sure that there's best practices but at the same time we have to talk about how to apply this thing practically there are conflicting opinions that may be yeah, and also I mentioned the status quo really briefly there's a there's a lot of pressure to not not like disrupt the boat too much. The idea that we're lucky to have what we have. And if we start spreading ourselves too thin by incorporating more modern band, um, then we'll lose what we have. Uh, I'm, uh, for example, in New York, the teachers in New York have something I'd never seen coming from the South, which was lesson time integrated throughout their teaching time. So they might teach uh, one period of an ensemble, one period of a general music, and then five periods of private lessons. And, and that's probably a nine period day. They still get a planning period, which is really crucial and incredible. That means that these students are getting one-on-one -on -one music or like two or three-on-one -on -one music lessons ever, from the start of band or whatever, choir and orchestra. Um, and that's unique and phenomenal. But if we ask them to add modern band because more students make music like that outside of the K through 12 world, then what are they gonna give up for it? A planning period or a private lesson? <laughs> And so it's it is this like just dichotomy of what what's the best option going with what we know or disrupting what we know to add something that we don't really know and we're not sure how it's gonna so yeah good questions and lots of similarities <laughs> I've got to go to Zach and then Jeremy yeah uh, that was first of all it's not clunky at all we navigated between the slides and the embedded video exactly as i have witnessed so thank you need to apologize liker liquor is still shaking me to the core. <laughs> two questions that i'm having one is i'm wondering from your dad you have any way of tapping into the specific type of research that people feel connected to and are incorporating into their classrooms. Like I think that someone could feel like, yes, I'm very connected to the research. Yes, I'm incorporating it in the classroom, but it could be just a very sort of niche practice and it could be to the complete exclusion of like research on pedagogy to say nothing to research on like 
you know, anti-racist pedagogy. And then the second question kind of just building off of Karina, and just, you'll have to speculate, but do you think that you would find similar patterns in just about every other field? You know, even though you're not supposed to do that, I'm not supposed to have assumptions about data before you get it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I kind of expected it. Like Karina, what she was just describing was just so common that I really thought we would see this uh, pattern in other fields. And I honestly was hoping that either special education or physical education would be the outliers. Phys physical education is pretty incredible. In the 70s, they were like the sports dudes and they were they got together and said, we got to find a way to make ourselves curricular instead of like the stuff people do after school. And they came up with um, health education. <laughs> Anybody could have done that and they did it. And it really like stuck them in the curriculum as vital. And it was so impressive that I kind of thought, well, it, physical education has to be doing this. They have to be the people, but you know, we won't, we'll never know. Um, so yeah, and same with special education, that that's almost a medical relationship that the field of special education should have with their researchers, because if you're not uptaking the newest information about medical um, knowledge and application of pedagogy related to students with specific um, mental and physical needs, then you're, you're negatively impacting them. So I don't know, maybe there is a stronger relationship in special education, I kind of thought there might be. We could ask Marissa. <laughs> Maybe she knows something that I don't. I haven't found. Uh, and then to the first part, the answer is no. I haven't done that. The closest I got to looking at the difference, like the specific research that they might uptake, was separating music research journals from trade journals, magazines. We have a lot of them, and quite frankly, a lot of research gets published in trade journals and magazines. But we're not. We're supposed to like ditch most of the citations, and you know, it's got to be accessible, which wild, right? I feel like I almost felt like it was going to be a, a given that K through 12 would be more interested in the trade journals and magazines because we literally have to write it accessibly. Why wouldn't we do that for the recent, the other stuff? I don't know. We don't even understand it. We keep publishing it. <laughs> I don't know. But no, I didn't do that. And I could, I'll take it. I took a note about it. Jeremy. Um, so one, one sort of thing I'm, I'm, a question that occurs to me is uh, and I know this isn't what you were, what you were going here, but I wonder if those numbers change for years, years teaching and years undergraduate. Yeah. Right. So like maybe you get a lot of higher numbers for some of those if you're three years out, four years out, five years out, and they go way down after twenty years. So right, the the danger of course is that we're we're looking at the mean scores or whatever, and we'll miss that difference. Um, but I, I, I'm just curious on the thought. Yeah, I think that that would make a lot of sense, right? If and I have the data, I just didn't. Honestly, I didn't even think to run that analysis. So thank you for the idea. Um, but yeah, Julia is right. She's in grad school and a teacher at the same time. So I wonder, I, I would think, yes, if they're being required to access research as part of their grad school work. But I don't know, because Julia, you heard her. She said neutral. Yeah. So maybe. Thank you. That's a great idea. Sherilyn. Oh, wow. That was, you prompted a lot of questions, buddy. Sherilyn first. <laughs> I'm just thinking back to the beginning of your the beginning of this before the talk started, and how nice it was to sit and have the music and looking at the visuals. Has anyone ever considered then doing 15 minute podcasts where you condense some of the research so that very busy music educators could actually listen to it in the car when they drive home or something? You would think that I would have thought of that as much work as I do with podcasts. <laughs> but my answer to that question is two parts. No, I have not thought of it. And also, I don't know if other people are doing it. Maybe it's out there and I just haven't looked for it. So that's great. I would listen to that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I need her stuff. Okay, so Kate, please. Hi, Kate. I'm just going to raise the same question because your student, uh, Julia, said, there was a, a, a time crunch, and also she had access to journals, but not everybody, if the person, the teacher wasn't in grad school, wouldn't have access to journals. I was thinking YouTube, podcasts, um, that those would make so much more sense. I love it. Podcast, YouTube, notes. I've got the notes. Thank you, Kate. One, one more question. I'm going to go to JR and then Michael and Heidi, maybe you talk to me after. Better be a good one. Nice. <laughs> Kind of following up on Jeremy, you have a way of distinguishing for the collegiate um, respondents who were 
Someone agreed, and you expected more. Do you have a way of distinguishing between those who actually did research and those who hadn't? I, done that? I don't think that I had any descriptive statistics that would have got at that. I mean, they have some subgroups here, like music technology, music theory, and I, they would do their own research that wouldn't be specific to music education pedagogy. So I guess I could look at that data, but I think that I'd have to ask it a little differently than just using what I've got here. Thank you, JR. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, I do have time because that was short. Michael. Uh, I'm just curious to know how common it is for schools to have non music teachers who are in charge of or supervising these programs. So, anecdotally speaking, my brother is one of the supervisors for his school's marching band, but he is a seventh grade social studies teacher who has never had music education, education in the classes and likely wouldn't even know what journals to be looking for in the research. So, I'm curious, is that a it's not that common, but in the state of New York, K through six music, K through six music is required, but it is not required to be taught by a music certified person. So it's totally possible. Often it is it is music certified teachers doing it, but as our school districts get smaller and they get in trouble financially. They can, they can take care of that in other ways. Um, we have music education has been trying to change that so that it's like secondary. Secondary, it, you are required to have a certified music teacher teaching your courses, but maybe not your extracurricular ensembles or events. Um, and so we're trying to make K through six like that, but that doesn't speak to your brother's experience. So, and I, would, I wouldn't know how to reach them, people in that situation. So that's something we should be asking. We being people like me. Do we have time for Heidi? Okay. Hi. So I wanted, I thought that was a great title for Denise. Great. Yes. And I also was very disappointed in the, the translation from the one point of view of that quickly too. But my question is, is with respect to the statistics, so because I love statistics. <laughs> and I noticed that what with respect to control factors and, and content on the factor, what is the trend with regards to the, one, the most surprising that you wanted to look at. You know, I okay, so I won't say that I wanted to look at this. The thing that was most surprising was that emergent third group and also the fact that there was no statistically significant relationship between that group's responses and either of the other groups. More than two thirds of the responses between K through 12 and collegiate were statistically significant. And so it's almost like this third group has this answer or knows how to toe this line between research and practition or practicing <laughs> application. <laughs> um, so that was that was definitely a surprise. I don't think that I'm that the group emerged now that I know the group exists, I don't think I'm surprised by their responses. Does that make sense? And as far as other confounding variables, I didn't there weren't too too many other that I was worried about just because of the narrow scope of the questions. And so hopefully that's true. I don't remember. It's been a minute since I've thought about that. <laughs> okay, uh, Kate, can we? One brief. Okay. Um, just in terms of a resource uh, for anti-colonial pedagogy and opportunities, the Teen Center uh, yeah. in Leon at the Armory um, was created to uh, be a showcase for teens who were doing non-traditional music and but the music that they were playing all the time to perform it there. And um, there's a large presence. There's a, a safe space. Uh, for the LGBTQ community in the Teen Center. So um, I think it's a nice uh, place for all different kinds of music to happen. Yeah. In the community. And yeah, if you don't know about the Teen Center already, definitely check it out. Our jazz combo and rock ensemble perform there pretty regularly now. So thank you. Uh, we're finished, and I just wanted to put that out. <laughs> thank you for your question. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. I appreciate it. Oh, I should stop recording. Okay, Mom, I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs> Great job. I love you. That's that's my son. <laughs> Bye, guys. Love you, right? Bye, buddy. Great job. Love you. Bye, bye. Thanks for being here, sweetie.